This is Paul Burnett interviewing Betty Gibbs for the Global Mining and Materials Research Project of the Business Series of the Oral History Center at the Bancroft Library. And uh, we're here in Denver, Denver, Colorado at the Convention Center. It's February 18th, 2015, and this is audio file one. Welcome. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit, as I usually do, about your background, where you grew up, and, uh, and, your, and your family. Yeah, I grew up in Virginia, and I'm the oldest of 10 kids. I uh, left home uh, just as the eighth one was born, so I really don't know my youngest brothers and brothers very well, but, uh -huh. uh, but I spent my childhood with, uh, in a large family, mm -hmm. very active uh, and so forth. My father uh, was a carpenter, and my mother was a court reporter, so... When I was like nine or ten, my mother started teaching me stenotype and typing. So, uh, so I spent a lot of uh, some of my childhood time uh, typing for my typing court cases for my mother. And but she also paid me. So by the time I graduated from high school, I had enough money for my first year in college. Really? Yeah, and it was my going away money. <laughs> it's like. <laughs> Okay, I'm out of here. <laughs> You've done your time. As I a did court, my time as a I, court stenographer. Yeah, uh, right. <laughs> well, I did transcribing, I, yeah. but I could read the notes. Right, right. You so. had to be able to read shorthand. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, it was a machine shorthand. Okay. It's a stenotype. You see them. You right. see them in the. They have them in the Senate. And, right, and the little so machine. And little the, machine. And the tape that yeah. goes into it. Yeah. Right. Great. Um, and so that was your going away, away money to uh, to college. Yeah. Did you have an idea of what you wanted to study? Well, um, and I didn't remember this until later, but I used to know a boy when I was about nine or ten years old, and he was very interested in geology, and he brought rocks around and all that kind of stuff. So it was kind of like a germinating sort of uh, idea. And then when I was a senior in high school, I was reading this book about uh, some a mining engineer in the West, and I don't think I'd ever even heard of a mining engineer before. But I had been thinking of going into engineering because I have two, had two uncles that were engineers. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to be a teacher, a housewife, or a secretary, or a nurse which in the 50s, that was, you know, those were the things that women did. That's right. And so I, I said, no, I don't want to do any of that. I've already done that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You, had, you, you had been supplied with, quote, quote, women's work by your mom. Plenty. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, no, I want to do something else. Right, so. right. Were there so. other um, women role models that you had? I mean, your uncles were role models, but did you, did you know of women who were professionals in the no. 50s? No. Nobody you knew? No, it was just, this is what I want to do. Yeah. And, you know, and I think there were probably some teachers or something that sort of just tried to discourage me, but mm -hmm. the I think the thing that carried me through school and working all these years is that this is what I want to do, you know? Yeah. Why? You know, so, okay, you don't think maybe it's a good idea? Well, <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, what are you doing here? Women don't belong here. Right. It's like, no. Nah. Yeah. You know? Right. <laughs> so you just sort of took it in stride. Yeah. If there, were, if there was some kind of hostility yeah. or opposition to your ideas. Yeah. So this would, this would occur when you would tell people about your plans and they would have that kind of reaction? Yes. Uh -huh. So I was not particularly encouraged. Yeah. Uh, there were a few people who said, oh, that really sounds interesting. And, mm -hmm. and I remember in high school, somebody must have come to the classroom and I said I wanted to be a mining engineer and they said, oh, you want to, you're going to go to the Colorado School of Mines? And I hadn't even thought about it at that point. Right. But uh, when I finished high school, I did uh, start at Virginia Tech. Yeah. And uh, because I was in state in Virginia, so. Um, you got the regular was, tuition. Yeah, I got regular tuition, tuition right? Yeah. yeah. And, and, and they had a mining engineering program. Right. Because I was also thinking about, well, maybe I can just go into geology. And then I looked in their book, oh, mining engineering, that's what I really want to do. Okay. 
and that includes a lot of geology. Right, of course, of course. So. Uh, do you remember what the tuition was in uh, in 1960? Uh, yeah, it was 1960, and it, I had a thousand dollars in my bank account, and I spent it in the first year. Mm -hmm. But that so carried you through the that year. That carried me through the year, including room and board, and and tuition, and books, and all of that. Wow. Times have changed. Boy, you can't even <laughs> go to school at all for a thousand dollars. I think anymore. you can get two or three textbooks for that. Right? Yeah, yeah, right, right. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, they're adjusted for inflation. It's yeah. a bit different, but yeah. but uh, um, so you went to Virginia Polytechnic uh, Institute, Institute, yeah, in um, Blacksburg. Okay, yeah. and was that far from where you were? I was about well, I was uh, from Northern Virginia, and that's down in Southwest Virginia, west right. Southwest of Roanoke. Right. Yeah, it was about three hours, but you know, at that time, it's like, that's fine. Further I'm away from home, the better it is. Yeah, yeah. going away <laughs> from college, the proverbial yeah, break. Yeah, right, yeah. exactly. Right. And when I started at Virginia Tech, of course, I was the only woman in mining, mm -hmm. but there were maybe there were a few other women engineers there because it was an engineering technological school. Right, and uh, there were about a hundred women there at, at that time. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That's not insignificant. In and 6,000 men, and I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, so, that's good. And it was also semi military. So there was right. like a required right. ROTC for uh, required military for the first two years. Yeah. Oh, is, is that? I'm that's not, me, Viet, not is Virginia that, Military right, Institute. Right, different institute. That's different. That's okay. all military. Right, right. At Virginia Tech, they did have a required military for the first two years. For men. Interesting. Right. Women didn't have to do it then. Right, right, yeah. right. And that was a big part in the 1950s that was, a, uh, I think, a lot of colleges had requirements yeah. for that, especially if they had any public right. money. I think that was... Well, uh, Virginia Tech is a land-grant college. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. That, that was part and parcel of, of mm -hmm. what you did in those yeah. days. It was different, right. different times. <laughs> right. um, and there is an interesting story about my first, uh, my first few weeks at school, mm -hmm. um, I um, I went to a a student. Uh, well, it was wasn't SME then; it was AIME. Mm -hmm. um, I went to a student meeting, a student se section meeting of AIME, and I walk in, and they said, "Oh, great! You can be the secretary." <clears throat> and I said, "Okay, sure. Why not?" You know, it's like. In a lot of ways, I'm kind of oblivious to some of the, you the know, coding. some of the, yeah, the yeah. coding. Yeah. It's like, oh, okay, well, thanks for asking. Yeah. You know, that yeah. was kind of my attitude about it. Right, right. And but the, that protected you in a sense because you didn't, yeah. it didn't bother you yeah. or it didn't, it didn't signify. I didn't a, know. A, a kind of, <laughs> a, 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 Any kind of a bias. Right, or, right, yeah. right. Um, and, and, and then the department head walked in. And and the, and he says, well, you know, we we can take you through the mining program. We can give you get you a degree in mining engineering, but you'll never be able to work as a mining engineer. But you can be an assistant to a president of a mining company. Mm -hmm. And again, I went, you know, because I had every intention of working as a mining engineer, not being a glorified secretary. Right, right. And often in, at so. those times that that. If there was any concession to having women in a professional um, training, mm -hmm. their eye was either to um, something, as you said, affiliated, or motherhood. Right? That this right. is your you, you could be, get science, you could become a scientist and help your husband with his experiments. Right. Or you could yeah. inspire your kid, your sons, yep. to become scientists. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so exactly. It, I mean, uh, Princeton did not allow women in graduate school until 1963. Wow. That's, uh, well, that's, those are the times. Women right? were not allowed to work in mines mm -hmm. in the 60s. And I think in Colorado, that didn't even change until the late 60s, early 70s. Mm -hmm. But my um, college career was kind of disjointed because I only had money for the first year. Mm -hmm. I worked in the summer. I had money for another quarter. And then I, I said, well, I don't have any more money. And my mother was... You know, they, they had a bunch of kids. Yeah. And 
so I, I said, okay, well, I'll quit. I quit school. I worked at Virginia Tech. I got a job there and doing secretarial work, which is fine. You know, I had the skills. And, um, and then after about six months or so, I started taking courses part-time. Because mm -hmm. if I took courses part-time, I didn't have to live in the dorm. Right. And I was, I was independent and always been really pretty independent anyway, mm -hmm. I reckon. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and so I stayed there doing that until about 1964. And then I came out to Colorado because it was like, oh, I want to go to the Colorado School of Mines. And I have an, had an uncle that lived in Boulder, and a friend of mine was driving out that year. So I said, oh, I'd like to go along with you. So I came out to Colorado, worked here for a year to get in-state status, and then went back to school Great. And, and worked during school to support myself. And uh, from that <clears throat> first time it was mentioned to you, Colorado School of Mines was kind of the, the Harvard of the mining industry? It was industry. kind of in the background. Yeah, there, yeah. this is, this right. is if, you really, if you really want to do it, this is the right. place to do yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And there, was, there were uh, fantastic professors there as well. Yeah, very good. Uh, yeah, School of Mines had professors then, and they still do, that have uh, actual industry experience. Yeah. And, and it's a very strong... You know, it's a very strong culture of when you get out of school here, you can go to work directly in a company and be productive yeah. from day one. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's strong academically, but there's this, it has, a, has its a own. A practical yeah. side. Yeah. 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 Right. Um, and one of the other people I interviewed talked about, and this is a bit before your time, but talked about uh, the kind of culture of the students and, you know, the nobody put on any airs and the except you know the it was common for them to wear their uh, i guess their engineering boots uh -huh, they wear them right. all the time like right basically this yeah is the, and you're always carrying your slide rule on your belt <laughs> so did you, so how was that for it sounds like a that sounds like a yeah. pretty masculine kind of culture um it was um and again it was like I don't know how to say it exactly. It was like, oh, I want to do this. I'm going to do it. Yeah. And, um, you know, people, I think, kind of probably made fun of me for a while. Mm -hmm. But eventually they realized that I was serious about it, yeah. you know, that I wasn't just there to find a husband. Right. I right. was there to get a degree in mining engineering and work as a mining engineer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you had conversations with people, I mean, did you... Did you establish friendships with, with um, oh, yeah. classmates and things? And yeah, so, and I still yeah. kind of keep up with a few of them. Yeah. yeah. And so it, I guess they just didn't know what to make of you. That's true. That's true. Right. And so yeah. it's a, Yeah, they called women pigs. And, you know, <laughs> wow. and I had this comment one time. Uh, you know, this guy kept looking at me and looking at me, and he says, you're feminine. I said, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But I didn't know what he was talking about. Well, I sort of knew. Yeah. But it was like, you know, they expected women engineers to be these big, hulky, you know, Butch, bulky yeah. sort of, yeah, yeah, yeah. people. And yeah. I, I didn't fit their, their viewpoint of what a woman engineer ought to look like. Right, yeah. right. They would assume Not that only you... that, I like to wear frilly blouses and, and, uh, <laughs> and I love embroidery. And <laughs> 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 Wonderful. So, so, so uh, <clears throat> You and I, in, a, in a way, I kind of did, did that deliberately, too. You had a persona. Yeah. And that was a way to sort of um, kind of stake out some territory identity-wise, right? You can't, yeah. You can't pin right. me down. Yeah. I'm here to work. But... I, don't, I don't need to be able to lift a jack leg by myself. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So. Um, but, but with help and with somebody else, you know, there, when... Um, there was another woman there that I got to be really good friends with, and mm -hmm. she, she and I took a lot of mining courses together. And she was a geologist, and mm -hmm. also started taking mining courses, and and ended up getting a, a dual degree, one in geology and one in mining. Mm -hmm. And uh, she and I took the school uh, mining course together. Mm -hmm. And between the two of us, we could carry a jack leg down down the uh, down the drift. How much does a jack leg weigh? More than I do. <laughs> wow. 
probably 7,500 pounds, right. and it's all dead weight. It's a big, long thing right. with an arm. Right, so there's, there's the, so, you know, it's, it's, it's unruly and, and awkward as well as being yeah, heavy. Yeah, very much. Right. But she and I could carry it down the drift, and we would take it. Right. And <clears throat> there is an interesting story there, too, because uh, in the first class, uh, Sam Shaw was the professor, and we all were sitting outside the mine, and, and he says, well, it's really hard to get A's in this class. If you've worked in the mine for a couple of summers, you might get an A. Yeah, but otherwise, don't expect A's here. Mm -hmm. So Pat and I just, uh, we, we loved it. Yeah. yeah, We just had such a good time. We tried everything. We did everything. Uh, I came up with an idea of, oh, I want to take pictures under, you know, take photos underground. So she and I did that. Well, we ended up getting A's. And, you know, we could hardly handle one of those jack legs by ourselves, but mm -hmm. we got A's. But I think it was because of our enthusiasm yeah. and our willing to try everything, our willingness to try everything yeah. and, you know, just be part of the group. Yeah, yeah. And you, so. and you did everything with gusto and, and you learned about the different aspects of the mind. Oh, and, yeah. And it, yeah. was it a... I mean, there's, we could you know, go on the gender track for a while, you know, talking about how you're kind of entering the quote, quote, man's world, and there's that excitement, I suppose. Mm -hmm. But more than that, just there's, there's an excitement about this is the real thing. Yeah, and, and it, I even hate, hate to say, like, entering the man's world, right. because to me, that isn't what it was at all. Yeah. It was like, Wow, I really like this stuff. I'm yeah. really interested in it, and this is what I want to do. Yeah, yeah. And and being male or female didn't seem to have anything to do with yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Even though there's all that and, coding, and there were there. certain reactions yeah. that came around that that reflected that gender difference. Mm -hmm. But still, I I think I was I was more focused on let's do the work. Yeah. You know, hey, I want to learn about this, and yeah. oh, this is cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The Dust is blowing all over the place, and I'm trying to climb up a raise, and yeah. and you know, but I loved it. And yeah. did it did it snap into focus the, the the quote quote book learning that you had been doing thus far? Like, did it you know did it, did it make real some of the theoretical and mathematical stuff that you had been doing for? Um, yeah, sort of in a way, but but it was more like. Well, the book learning is fine, but this is the real thing. Yeah. And and it's um I don't know quite how to express it. It's like, you know, there's a almost a disconnect between what's in the book and yeah. and the actual practice. Right, right. Yeah. And that hooked you at that moment. Oh you yeah. Were, yeah. Yeah. Was, you were if if right. you were had any doubts before, yeah. this cemented your 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 commitment to, to doing this. Yeah, and Pat was also a great mentor because she and her husband had mining claims outside of Idaho Springs. Oh, really? So, and they had kids, and I had a little girl at that time. And uh, and they used to take us up to uh, to their claims, and Pat was always talking about, well, we've got these claims, and it has this kind of minerals in it, and we'd like to develop them. And so that, that you know, she probably did as much or more for me than anybody else. Mm -hmm. And we were peers for sure, yeah. but but it was like the interest. Yeah. It was the interest and enthusiasm, yeah. and someone you could talk to about yeah. about uh, about yeah. your enthusiasm for the work. Yeah. Um, and that's also interesting too that others from from that period and before were that that there were people you could, as an individual, you could have a mind claim, and there could be you know there there were just groups of people. Yeah. Just a couple of people. Yeah. Who were working in an old abandoned mine, which is a, I can't remember the name, the term for it, but you're basically kind of pulling out pillars mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, and continuing to work something that's long been abandoned or or a new claim. Mm -hmm. And it's just hard to fathom, you know, when you think of mining, you just think of giant merged corporations today that have large mm -hmm. equipment and a and billion dollars of investment to develop a mine, permitting and all that. And here's this kind of wildcat approach to to mining, and it's can right. can you tell me about how that's done or how that was done at the time, and 
what people did? <laughs> um, well, there, there weren't so many regulations. Yeah. There certainly were some because, uh, like in Colorado, there was a division of mines. And, um, and this was also very interesting because, of course, with Pat and Al having all of these mining claims, they knew the mine inspector very well. And the mine inspector was very supportive of both Pat and I mm -hmm. in, you know, in our studies and, and getting into the mining business. And he was the one who actually um, helped get the legislation passed so that women could work underground. Oh, really? Yeah. So in a, in a small so. way, you two were kind of a part of that impetus, perhaps. Yeah. And he may have been doing it anyway, right. but, but he saw well, that you were there. And yeah, were... And, and he saw that, that we were serious about it. I mean, you know, we weren't you know, throwing our bras acro across right. the room or anything right. like that. We were just sort of matter-of-factly doing, doing these it. things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and he was a good guy. He lived a long time. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so you stayed in touch with him? Yeah. And, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Um, it's an interesting. It's an interesting history, and that, that we could we could talk about that uh, uh, a lot. Um, but just perhaps one more question: uh, Did did anything you learn about that domain of the kind of I don't know, call it, call it amateur claims, but but this kind of mm -hmm. DIY mining? Do it uh, yourself. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> did that did that translate over to the, to the what you learned in the mining school and what you did subsequently at all? Um, I, th I think that what it did as much as anything was it sort of connected me with the real mining, mm -hmm. the, you know, the reality of mining that, that we dig rocks out of the, out of the, <laughs> out of the mountain yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and then we, you know, there's something in them right. that we can get out that's, that's worth something. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of all started hanging together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's something yeah. kind of mythic about it too, and in, in the oh, the Tommy the, knockers and the <laughs> yeah, and then another yeah. another person I talked to, uh, you know, he was he was reading kind of adventure stories as a kid, and, and mm -hmm. sort of the there's something romantic about about oh, mining yeah. at right. that level. Oh yeah, you know, uh, as part of Definitely. part of stories and, and well, well, my my high school story that I was reading was about a mining engineer who was going out to some claims, and there were prospectors, and you know, he was uh, proving that these claims were worth mining and all of that sort of stuff, mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and so it's like you know the 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 old time prospector image, and. You know the guy who goes out and beats on the rock, and he doesn't necessarily know uh, very much about the technology. But you know, other than, well, okay, I can pound this rock into small pieces and get some gold out of it. Right. And and I thought I just thought that I I loved adventure stories when I was growing up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so there is that a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so you are at Colorado School of Mines. In the mid-60s, 1966 yeah. until 1969. 69, yeah. yeah. Those are heady <laughs> times in the United States. Uh, and you're in Golden, Colorado at that time. So perhaps a bit removed uh, from that. But it's on the radio. It's on the television. And mm -hmm. So what was it like? Is it just kind of uh, in the background? Or, or was it because so much of this happening, uh, and I think it, we just did the 50th anniversary of the free speech movement at Berkeley, mm -hmm. uh, and, and that all that was going down in 1964, and Berkeley got its reputation for this uh, place where unrest Oh, happens. yeah, well, I moved to Boulder in 1964, and yeah. that was kind of before the hippie movement, and mm -hmm. the hippie movement kind of started coming around about 67 or so. And, mm -hmm. And so it was like, I was kind of drawn to that, mm -hmm. but I still had this thing about, you know, I want to get this degree. Yeah. So I was kind of like in, in Boulder, I was very conservative. And at the School of Mines, I was kind of a hippie. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did, were, were you drawn to the music at all and that kind of thing? Um, some, yeah. not so much the music, but mm -hmm. just kind of the, the counterculture thing, mm -hmm. uh, you know, rebellion against uh, the rigid ideas of 
things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that resonated with you, obviously, because yeah. you're breaking those boundaries. Yeah, because <laughs> I'm a little strange and uh, I don't follow the norm. Right, right, right. Things right. like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think that was it. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And... Because um, it wasn't the drug thing. You know? No, it's no. It's not very much into the drug thing. Yeah, so. that comes to Colorado maybe a bit later. Uh, well, no, it was here it then. Was there? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. It was here. It was big. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, the, but another thing to me at that time was um, I said, I'm in school. Don't party during the week. Don't do, don't do anything. I don't drink during the week. Yeah. If I want to drink and have fun, I do it on the weekends. Mm -hmm. And I, ne I never really got into it. And yeah. Drinking yeah. and things in a big way. Right. But, I, oh, I was also interested in folk dancing at the time. And that was, that was a, uh, that's a pretty clean living kind of group. Yeah. So, uh, so I would come up to Boulder on Friday nights to go folk dancing. And, and uh, that was, you know, sort of my life. Yeah, yeah. And a, and a social so, outlet that is not school. Yeah. And right. that was, it's important for a lot of people to have one yeah. thing that, one and, group of And people. it wasn't talking with engineers. It was talking with all sorts of other people. And, right. Right. And I really loved the dancing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What kind of folk dancing? International. Okay. Um, you know, like uh, Russian and Greek were some of my favorites. Oh, wow. Israeli and Scandinavian. Um, and there were, oh, Eastern European, mm -hmm. like Yugoslavian and Hungarian. And wow, great. Ukrainian and uh -huh. all sorts of other <laughs> cool stuff like that. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, uh, you're able to finish your BSc in mining engineering. Well, it's actually engineer of mines degree. An engineer of mines degree. Yeah, because it required more uh, hours than a bachelor's. Okay. Okay. And we got a little silver diploma at the time. Okay. Yeah. Great. So I got I have two silver diplomas because a couple of years later I went on to graduate school. That's right. I worked for Consol for coal and for two years and mm -hmm. then went to graduate school and got a, another one. So, so uh, as, as you had been told that what was good about Colorado School of Mines, you said it's kind of a direct conduit to the workforce. Yeah. That happened for you. Yeah. As you finished your first degree, right. you were right in it. Yeah, um, and, and I pretty much figured I could get a job. Yeah. And I did. And did you, uh, so did you apply to a posting or were you, uh, did, sometimes it's informal things like a friend, you know, was working well, there. No, they, um, they had um, people, recruiters, recruiters come to the okay. school. Yeah. So I interviewed several places, and, um, and I walked into the interview with this guy from Consol. <clears throat> it was Consolidation Coal yeah. at the time. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I guess I impressed him because they offered me a job. Right. You know? right. and some, people were, you know, some people were sort of uh, put off. Mm -hmm. by a woman who was in engineering, but, but every now and then I would come across somebody who really uh, sort of was, oh, this is, this is good. Right, a yeah. supportive. Yeah. 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 Right. And so uh, and they hired you. What was the nature of the first position? I was hired at the, in the exploration department okay. at Consol, and they, I think, did not quite know what to do with me. And, and they put me on this project. It was uh, you know, building a geological database. Right. And this was sort of the beginning of my interest in computers mm -hmm. because I'm kind of lazy. I don't like to sit around punching a calculator. I'd rather put it in a computer and let the computer do the work. Right, of course. Of <laughs> yeah. course. So, um, so that was my first job. And uh, it was kind of interesting because they had had, I don't know, several people that had wor started working on this project mm -hmm. and they really never quite got it off the ground. Mm -hmm. And I went in there and just started doing it. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and it's their database project is still going to this day. Of course, it's changed a lot. I bet. But I bet. somebody had to get in there and go through the old printed records and get them into uh, punch cards. Right, right. And this yeah. is uh, core data and that kind of stuff. Yeah, uh, yeah, like drill hole data. Right, right. Yeah. Um, so that's a that's a massive transition, and that happened. You know, that's that's something. That yeah, happened. this was like 1970. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. And so did you have to write the code for the data? Like, did you create the database? I created the database. What okay. I did was I, uh, we, they had a computer department, and the mm -hmm. computer department actually wrote the code. Mm -hmm. um, and they built the database system. They were working on programs to, um, to plot the drill logs, and they had a program that would do some contouring. Mm -hmm. And uh, But I supplied the data that went into that. Mm -hmm. So... What I did was I worked with them to develop some data forms, you know, because I knew what kind of data there was. So I developed the forms uh, along, you know, kind of back and forth with the computer department. Right. Um, and and I think that probably what my initial contribution was is like, okay, here's the data. Uh, Here's what we want to do with it. Mm -hmm. And so my creative part was how do I go from here to what we want to do with it and what kind of information is needed from, from this original paper data mm -hmm. to satisfy what goes into the computer programs. So, right. So it's an iterative process yeah. back and forth a little bit. And there, there were some other uh, computer things going, you know, database things going on at the time. So, mm -hmm. so I did some research around. Um, I also visited a lot of the Consol mines mm -hmm. and said, you know, this is what we're doing and, you know, we're wanting to, you know, we're going to build this database and, you know, how does this fit with what you are doing here? Right. Presumably you have to sample so, over time, like, uh, what kinds of records were being kept? Because I imagine they change. They would add columns. In yeah, particular areas. right. And you know, like there are certain. Uh, I think it was even the USGS at that time had uh, some codes for like SH for shale, SS for sandstone, LS for limestone, and so forth. So, so I incorporated those and um, and then started sitting down. I I started writing stuff into these forms. Mm -hmm. And then that kind of got going. And then the, um, the head of the department hired a couple of people to, to just do the, you know, that straight coding because that's really, mm -hmm. that's a clerical thing. And, yeah. and yeah. I guess he realized I had more to offer than, right. <laughs> than just, you know, writing, writing stuff in little columns. Well, that may have been uh, part of it initially because um, historically, Computing as as tabulation work had been quote quote women's work like they had you know right. it had been right. there was a way for them to sort of translate in their heads what you know where does this person mm -hmm. fit um, but coding and and so writing software and doing some of the yeah. higher end stuff that y you were right. getting involved in was was different and I did start r writing some software at the time mm -hmm. um, and I really had not studied any programming languages but. Mm -hmm. Um, somebody, a couple of guys in the uh, computing department sort of took me under their wing and said, oh, you can do this, and we have this time-sharing system, and here's how, here's how you make a basic program. So I learned that part, and mm -hmm. then that, and I, um, the, I was, you know, I was talking, the, the um, department head knew what I was doing. Yeah. So he's, he showed me this big, long, you know, kind of accounting sheet that had all these calculations in it, and uh, it was uh, float sink calculations, something you do with coal, yeah. how much you do certain things to it and get rid of the bad stuff and keep the good stuff. Mm -hmm. So anyway, there were probably maybe 15 or 20 columns of this thing, and, and he knew I was playing around with learning some programming, and he says, can you write a program for this? And, mm -hmm. I did it in a couple of hours. <laughs> is that what they call a flow sheet? Is that no, 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 no that's, that's different. Okay, that's different. Okay, but he had the. It was like a what you would put into a spreadsheet now. Right, right. It was basically a spreadsheet on paper. Right, right. And so you wrote the code um, for that. And I wrote the code for it in just a couple of hours. I mean, maybe an afternoon or something, yeah. and took it into him. And he was, oh, oh, oh. You know, and boy, was he impressed. <laughs> so, um, so it's just for me, it seemed like a little thing, but it was, right. you know, it was a transition point. I think you realized you got that kind of really positive feedback. It was so 
relatively simple for you, but they were amazed yeah. that you could yeah. do this. And, and right. uh, it is, was that an aptitude that you had been aware of? No, it, yeah. not at all. And what, what is that? How would you describe that aptitude? Organizational? It's, uh, it's an ability to see what needs to be done, break it down into parts, and do it a bit at a time and say, oh, let's see, I need to do this calculation. And how would I do that in BASIC? Or how would I do that in Fortran? And, yeah. and so it's, it's like, a, I don't know, development, I guess. Yeah, development and, and you're solving a puzzle. I yeah. Say, definitely. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and w did you excel at mathematics? Is it something? No. <laughs> No. I wasn't all that good at math. I'm much huh. better at, at text. Huh. And I love literature. I almost switched over to English, an and English major at one point. But then wow. I decided, well, no, I'll just go to, Eng I'll go to stay in engineering because I can always read. <laughs> 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 and I still read. I'm reading Chaucer again right now. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Wonderful. So you've kept those, that interest. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I have a wide variety of interests. Great. Well, we, we definitely need to fit that in there. For yeah. Sure. As we go along, if you yeah. have interests that you want to talk sure. about. I mean, I guess your hobbies evolved over time, and, and, uh, or did they stay the same pretty much? Well, reading, of course. Is... Reading, yeah, I still love science fiction, mm -hmm. so I've been doing that for 50 years. Yeah. What do you love about science fiction? Um, it's exploring new avenues of things and, um, you know, new, new, different ways of looking at things mm -hmm. and, and it's like, okay, suppose there's this situation, how might it evolve if something happened, you know, right. like, right. like alternative histories right. sort of thing. Right, counterfactual kind yeah, of things. Yeah, or, or going to the stars and, right. you know, so I think it really expands the mind. It does, and it seems to be particularly, um, and not to reference any stereotypes, but it does it seem to be particularly resonant with engineers, that, mm. that there's this, um, yeah, like exactly the way you say, that you start yeah. from a, uh, a slight alternative point, and then you develop it with your imagination, and you follow, yeah, follow, right. a, follow a trajectory. Yeah, yeah and so right. And, and I, and right now I'm reading some of the older science fiction, because I have these books from like the 50s and 60s, yeah. and and you know they're projecting technologies, so it's very interesting to see, uh, you know, what they thought might have happened, and mm -hmm. and almost none of them had the vision of our computer technology, you know, the level of computer technology that we have by now. Yeah, yeah. You know? and overestimated others, the flying yeah. cars and all of that right. stuff. Right, <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, probably Arthur C. Clarke got the closest. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's, there's, there's, uh, uh, so this is kind of off the topic, no, I no, guess, not at all. but uh, not at all. it's, it's yeah. all part of it. Um, mm -hmm. but in, early on you show this aptitude for, um, for, uh, working with computers. How, mm -hmm. do you remember how old the computer department at Consolidated was when you started? Um, roughly. See, that was in 1970. Hmm. Um, it had probably been there for as much as 10 years. Yeah. 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 So when they, when they got the well, first mainframes out. Right. And, well, they were doing business computing. Right. But the techno technical computing was probably only a couple of years old at that time. So ground floor. Yeah. Ground floor. Yeah. yeah. And it, it mushrooms into all kinds of different applications as, oh, yeah. a, a, and, and, and as the 70s uh, move on, as computer processing power evolves. Um, but so what really made the big difference was the introduction of the PCs, mm -hmm. because then we as engineers could have them on our desks. Yeah. And you didn't have to share time. Right. <clears throat> and we had a little computer there. It was very basic. but. Um, but it was a start, mm -hmm. and I remember at the beginnings um, there were, you know, it was like, boy, I'd really like to see a picture of this whole deposit, and I want to look at it from dimensions. different angles, <laughs> and, and uh, you know, and then I want to put a drift in there, and 
boy, we can do those things now. It is so exciting to me to have started from that point yeah. and see these things that I dreamed about then that are you know, common today. When did you first have uh, the, the vision of a three-dimensional rotatable model for uh, uh, a mine? Oh, that was probably in the 70s. Yeah. yeah. And, mm. and I was working at uh, Climax. There were two companies that were doing mining, mining computing mm -hmm. sort of things. And one of them is still around. That's Mintech. And, um, and they, they had a system, you know, it was still two-dimensional, but they had some basic graphics and not just, you know, like we used to get um, uh, con contour maps that had little numbers in them, you know, mm -hmm. little numbers in a square because it was like a printer right. sort of thing. So you print numbers and that represents a contour. Right. And they had some graphics and... Um, you know, and some of it, some of the, it, it wasn't all my original ideas because, mm -hmm. you know, we would sit around in these, in these um, sessions and kind of talk about it, mm -hmm. you know, but, and the, the developers were saying, well, you know, yeah, this is what we'd really like to do. Mm -hmm. And gradually the, the uh, graphics capabilities got better and, and the, and there were, starting to be more companies that were developing mining software mm -hmm. and incorporating graph you know these graphics that were being used for other things yeah. like um, you know I think that the uh, space program had a lot to do with yeah. improvement of the um, of the technology mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so so the mining comp the mining uh, software developers were adapting that technology into their into their work. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm curious about how mind maps prior to this represented the, like how did they show um, the necessarily three-dimensional, because you really need that, you know? Well, they didn't. Yeah. They were two-dimensional. They were two-dimensional maps. You, yeah. You'd have a series of maps, mm -hmm. you know, like one for each level, say, in the mine, mm -hmm. and then you and I did drafting, a lot of drafting too. Okay. And um, and the maps would have like the outlines of, say, if it's a vein mine okay. or, or vein deposit, then mm -hmm. you would have the outlines of the drifts, and you would have uh, numbers on there that represent the the uh, the grade of the material, and mm -hmm. you know maybe the volume and things like that. And then then you would write those on a sheet. Yeah. So and then. Um, and then, the, then you just kind of put it all together. But most of those pictures were right here. Yeah, because yeah. would, there would be there would be numbers or some kind of representation to signify the z-axis that would give you a, a sense of. Well, yeah, sort of. Sort of. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not, but not quite. <laughs> yeah. Right. Because you know you could do cross sections and yeah. you could do plans. Right. But it was it was very difficult to manually convert those into a three dimensional drawing. Right, right. Now what what happened a lot during that time and, and actually before that, years and years before that, was people would make models out yeah. of like um, plastic sheets and you know, they'd take the cr cross sections that the geologists put together and then take these plastic sheets and put them in a frame. And in some of the mining museums, you can still see those. Oh, that's phenomenal. Yeah. In fact, I was out at a company in uh, Utah a few years ago, and they had one, one of these um, three-dimensional models of, of their mining process. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's, that's yeah. extraordinary. Yeah. Um, so there are, you know, there are all these kind of different efforts to sort of represent what is kind of this blind world uh, mm -hmm. underground. And that so essential to 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 understand the three dimensional dimensions of yeah, this, right? right you can run because into another it is, <laughs> yeah it is three dimensional you're there in this little yeah. little drift if and, you go too far you can and collapse you, a roof and then, <laughs> and you have to and i think this is one thing that served me is pretty well is that i have a, a good spatial sense so i can visualize what it looks like in mm -hmm. three dimensions mm -hmm. and you know, it's almost like 
the technology is to the point where you can lose that ability if you, if you don't exercise it. Let's go back okay. again. And, and uh, so you've got a, a couple of years there where you're at Consolidated Coal, um, mm -hmm. uh, 1969 to 71. And then you go back uh, to school. To graduate school. Yeah. Can yeah. you talk about that? Was that a, a, a natural foregone conclusion that you needed to no. do? Yeah. <laughs> no. You it wanted was, to? I just wanted to go a little bit further. Yeah. And um, I was living in Pittsburgh and I wanted to come back to Colorado and I thought that would be a good excuse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. That's no more complicated than that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, uh, and then it would give me more credentials yes. out in the, in the uh, mining world. Yeah, yeah. And it sounds yeah. like... So the, some, of, some of both. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you need both, it seems. Uh, you don't get respect unless you've actually been in the mines. Right. And you don't get respect unless you have the credentials. And you right. kind of need to dance between those two worlds. Yeah. Um, and the, uh, uh, there, was there a thesis component of the... Yes. Master's? Yes, yeah. I wrote a thesis in, on ventilation, right. and that was something that I had worked on some at Consolidation Coal, mm -hmm. was um, a, a ventilation project, and that mm -hmm. was kind of in addition to the, uh, to the exploration database mm -hmm. thing that I was working on. And in terms of next, next steps, did you think, um, were you always thinking, I want to be in the industry, I want to be in the mines? Yeah, yeah, and after graduate school, I said, I don't want another office job. I'm going to apply for jobs in mines. Mm -hmm. And when I got out of school, and this is kind of an interesting story also, because um, I was out of school. I had been so busy getting the degree that I hadn't really looked around for jobs. And um, I went to the, um, the school placement. The school had a placement office at that time. So I went over there, and I said, you know, I'm really, I'm out of money. I really need a job. What do you suggest? And at that time, um, Climax Molybdenum had a had an office like just across the road, across Sixth Avenue from the school. So they said. So he says, "Oh, I'll just send you over to Bill Dessler, and you can talk to him and see." You know, because I said, "Really want to work in a mine. I've got the desk stuff. I want to work in a mine, get the mining experience." And mm -hmm. so I went over. And I just walked in, no appointment, because my Volkswagen bus was just about to break down. And <laughs> those were the days. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I don't think there's any scene in the early 70s that doesn't have a Volkswagen yeah, bus in it. Right. Yeah, right. And something. I had one. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, I walked in and you know, told the secretary I would like to talk to Bill Disler and so and so at the School of Mines had sent me over and so he must not have been terribly busy because he did let me in to talk to him. So, uh, so I sat down and I could feel this hostility from him. Oh. And so I just sat there and just talked and yeah, I've done this and I've done that and I, I really want some in mine experience and blah, 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 and gradually I could see him kind of changing, mm -hmm. and he was kind of warming up to the idea that, oh, well, maybe we can give this a try. Yeah. And that's how I got my job at Climax, mm -hmm. and I was the first woman to work underground there. Yeah. Wow. And I started as an underground engineer. Mm -hmm. And it was very interesting because, uh, well, first, they didn't have a place for women to change because I was the only woman yeah. that was working there. So they did find a separate dry for right. me. And, um, and then the first day I remember, you know, they have these windows where the miners come up and they get their brass yeah. for, the, for the day to go, yeah, yeah, their underground ID. And, yeah. and you know, I was, I put my diggers on and walked behind the, the windows there, and was talking to, talking to some of the other engineers or the managers or ship bosses or something or other. All these guys kept looking through the window and saying, "What are they looking at?" <laughs> because I didn't think of myself as anything other than, "Oh, here I am going to work in the mine. I'm so excited about it, and right. I'm going to 
got this engineering job, and yeah, I know how to survey underground and stuff like that. Was it the proverbial dropped jaws and stairs kind of thing? Yeah, yeah, very much. Yeah. And of course they knew I was coming. Yeah. But there was still, a, there was a cognitive dissonance for them. There's yeah. some, something here doesn't right. make sense. <laughs> they're right. Pro and they're processing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. And, and, I, and there was, uh, I don't think they knew, again, well, I did have the job as an underground engineer, so I knew that I would be surveying, but yeah. I think that the company was not sure how it was going to work out. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I treated people underground just like a, treated everybody kind of like a little bit sarcastic and mm -hmm. you know lay some shit on me I'll lay it back you know right, and right. stuff like that mm -hmm. so, so I got along I got along so it's a uh, mm -hmm. one of the uh, others I interviewed talked about um, respect down in the mine and it has to be earned mm -hmm. you can't just right. you know you're technically uh, at a in a senior position but you need buy-in yeah. from the, right. the miners and the people, and, and the, the, the mutual respect has to be established. Is that, is that similar? Oh, case? yeah, very much. And I th they knew that I had the degrees, mm -hmm. and they respected that. The miners did. And, and I think that the, um, the managers did, and the other engineers did as well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was just like a well, can she really do the job? You know, she's got the degrees. Can she really do the job? And I really could do the job. Right. And I don't know. That was, I think there's more to it than that, sure, I suppose. Sure, I but, bet, yeah, yeah. But, but overall. Overall, yeah. it went pretty well. Yeah. I think it was just, for you, it was, it was really focusing on the work. Yeah. And focusing on communicating your, your right. capabilities. Um, and, and being confident. It sounds like... It sounds like you didn't have much of a confidence problem. Oh, really yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> you did? You did? Yeah. But, but I don't let it show on the outside right. very much. Right. Yeah. So you, you knew that you had to show no fear and go Not in. exactly. I didn't no. know that. It was just no. that's how it was. Mm. It's like, yeah. Uh, well, you know, kind of in perspective, uh, my mother was very disciplinarian mm -hmm. and you know really pretty harsh with yeah. us kids mm -hmm. and all of this seemed easy in comparison to that <laughs> <laughs> and I certainly love my mother <laughs> and she did an amazing job of raising 10 kids yeah you know? but she was tough yeah and I've I think that probably carried me through an awful lot of stuff because it just didn't seem as bad yeah <laughs> <laughs> Take note, helicopter parents. <laughs> yeah, all right. <laughs> um, so, yeah. so, uh, so you 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 didn't have deliberate strategies for doing it. You just knew you were going to do it because you really yeah. liked it. Yeah, I that, loved it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I loved being underground. I loved loved doing the work, and mm -hmm. you know, it was very exciting to yeah. me. Yeah. yeah. And it's surveying work, so you were um, gathering data about the... Yeah, I carried the transit around underground and mm -hmm. set it up and, you know, did the, did the work, mm -hmm. did the surveying. Yeah. Because you had to survey drifts, make sure they, they were staying straight. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so that was your first, uh, uh, first position, and it... It wasn't anything to do with mine ventilation. It was. It was later. It was. I okay. I, um, I worked at I worked underground for about six months, mm -hmm. and they were just starting the open pit there. And when I had interviewed up there, I had talked to a guy who was doing some computer programming for open pit design, mm. and you know, and I we we kind of connected, so he knew that I understood the computing part of it. Mm -hmm. So. Um, after about six months, he needed some help in the in the mine planning department. Mm -hmm. So I went to work in the mine planning department and worked there for a couple of years. And, oh. and then uh, I had one summer as a shift boss for an environmental crew. And then I worked in the ventilation department about the last year mm -hmm. that I was there. And what work? Um, uh, what work did a um, 
environmental engineer do in the mid 1970s? Uh, well, we planted trees. We did uh, seeding of the tailings ponds. Okay. Um, you know, we uh, our crew did remediation. Basically. Yeah, remediation sort of things, and uh -huh. there wasn't a lot of uh, testing of. There was maybe a little bit of water testing, but mm -hmm. not very much. So it wasn't re in response to federal regulations so much? Um, was it mm, sort of Not like, so much. It, no, was it was kind of, this is how you do it, and it yeah, part, of, part yeah. of the practice of the mines that right. has, a, has evolved over time. Yeah, and, and there were some that were kind of starting because this was like the early 70s, so yeah. it was just getting started, but, right. but it wasn't, you didn't have to learn all of these convoluted contradictory regulations. <laughs> Some <laughs> of the regulations said, were contradictory? Oh yeah, yeah, they still are. <laughs> it's gotten worse. <laughs> what are, what are, what, can you tell me an example of a contradictory set of regulations for, for uh, um, environmental remediation? And yeah, and I'm not really up on that, mm. but, uh, okay. but I know I've had uh, experiences in Boulder County mm -hmm. with uh, land use regulations there, and, and a contradictory regulation would be something like well, we have to do wildfire mitigation, but you can't cut down your trees. <laughs> yeah, that sort of thing. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. All right.